next few, uh, next month, uh, we have uh, Leon Balance or Balance, B A L E N T S, another UCSB professor, to take us down into the micro world, and then uh, a UCS UCLA graduate student named Briley Lynn Lewis is going to come up from UCLA. She's getting her doctorate and she wants to take us back out into space again for October 4th. And on November 1st, Dr. Jean Carlson from the physics department of UCSB. I think she may be more on uh, microscopic uh, quantum, but then again, who knows? Right now, Without further ado, this man's going to take us back to the Higgs boson, which is pretty recent, seven years, and tell us everything we don't know. I know Mr. Higgs is still celebrating. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Claudio Campanieri. Center, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, uh, it, it, uh, it uh, captured the, the, the imagination of people and the attention of the international media, and we got a lot of, a lot of publicity. Uh, and so now, today, I'm going to try to explain to you uh, what the Higgs boson is, why, why it's important, and what we've done in, in these seven years since, uh, since the discovery. But the, the, the main thing about the Higgs boson is that it's been a great discovery, but as I will point, uh, try to explain to you, it puts us in a state of confusion. Uh, we do not know what to do with it anymore. I mean, not with it, but we don't know what it means and we are, we are confused. So I'll explain to you why that is. So uh, masses, so the, the, I will, I will say many, many things about masses. I will keep talking about masses. And, and I'm a particle physicist, and the things that we deal with are very, very small. We just spent uh, half an hour in this fascinating um, planetarium looking at the very big. I, I work on the very small, uh, the, the opposite, as somebody, somebody mentioned before. But actually, it turns out that uh, particle physics and astrophysics have a very strong connection. And maybe some, one of these days you should invite somebody to talk about that because I think it's very interesting, actually. But anyway, particle physics, the masses of the particles that we're talking about are tiny. And so when we talk about the masses, we don't, we don't give the mass in grams or in pounds. And uh, it is more convenient for us to use the, probably the most famous equation in physics, E equal mc squared, energy is equal to mass times the velocity of light squared. And we give the, the masses in units of energy. So we turn the mass into energy by, multiply, by dividing by c squared. And we do not use uh, the mass, the units of, mass, of energy, uh, joules, or, or what you get uh, billed for in, uh, when you pay your electric bill, kilowatt hours. <laughs> uh, we use something called the electron volt. Uh, uh, one electron volt is a typical energy involved in chemical reactions. Uh, but to remember, one thing to remember is that proton uh, has a mass of about one giga electron volt, or GeV, which is one billion electron volts. So I will talk about GeV all the time. Think about that's the one one electron volt is the mass. Sorry, one giga electron volt is the mass of the proton. Okay. So as I said, uh, I'm a particle physicist. Uh, we deal with this with a very small. Uh, so an atom has a size of about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. 
inside the atoms there is the electron and as far as we know the electron has no size hmm. uh, a nucleus which is 10 to the minus 12 which is telling you that the atom is mostly empty space uh, inside the neutrons there's there uh, sorry is that inside the nucleus we have protons and neutrons 10 to the minus 13 is the size of a proton and inside the proton of the neutron we have quarks and as far as we know quarks also have no dimensions less than 10 to the minus 16 centimeters mm -hmm. so this is this is the polar opposite of what we were talking about <laughs> a, few, a few minutes ago so we have a we have a model of particle physics that tells us uh, what the basic building blocks of matter are, are. And we start out with the stuff that uh, we are made of. So we're made of protons and neutrons, so nuclei atoms, so protons and neutrons, and, uh, and electrons. And the protons and neutrons are made up of quarks, call them up quarks and down quarks. <laughs> and then there are, there's the electron, and then uh, there's also the photon, which is associated with electricity and magnetism and light and x-rays and gamma rays and radio waves, all of that stuff. So the, the, the world around us is just made of these four things, okay? But, but there is more. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the quarks need to be, need to do, the quarks, the quarks make up the proton and something has to keep the protons together, the, the quarks together into a proton. And we have a theory of that, and the, there are particles that are associated with this force uh, to glue together the, qu the quarks into a proton. <laughs> And these particles are called gluons, okay? <laughs> because they glue things together. Uh, then there is a radio then we can see then there's some radioactive decays, and neutrinos are emitted in some radioactive decays. And then there's these other particles called W and Z bosons, which are associated with these radioactive decays. And so this would be all, but it's not all, because it turns out that this pattern gets repeated three times. <laughs> Uh, they are, we call them three generations or three families. And so, so this is the up, up quark, down quark. Then there's another quark called the charm quark and the strange quark. <laughs> and the top quark and the bottom quark. <laughs> okay? And the muon and the tau. So a muon is just like an electron, only it's 200 times more, 200 times heavier. And the charm quark is like the up quark, only a lot heavier. Hmm. So there's this repetition of this pattern that repeats itself three times. And these are our building blocks of matter. And uh, the amazing thing is that the, you think about building blocks, and so you think that if you're, if you're putting something out, building something out of building blocks, that the building blocks would be more or less, more, have more or less the same mass. But they absolutely don't. Uh, so this is, a, this, is a, this is the first generation, this is the second generation, this is the third generation, and this is the mass. In, Giga electron volts, okay? So the top quark is the heaviest of, the, of them all, and it's 175 giga, giga electron volts. So this is a, a, a building block of matter which weighs 175 times the proton. And then if you go back to the electron, that's 0 0.0005 giga, no, more, more zeros. <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, 0. 0. 0. 0.0005 electron, uh, giga electron volts, 10 to the minus 3. And then we have the neutrinos, which are even, you know, even lighter. So it, it's a mystery, okay? We, have, we absolutely don't understand this pattern. Why is it uh, that... Come yep. oh. it, sometimes the, the weakness okay. of the signal coming through the cable. Okay, why is it that, uh, that there are three of these, uh, three replications, and why are the masses uh, so different? We have no idea. Anybody can figure it out. Uh, there is a there's a ticket for you to Stockholm to pick up your money. <laughs> okay. So now, what about the Higgs then? Well, it turns out that if you write down this theory, the theory makes mathematical sense if and only if all of the masses are zero. By mathematical sense, I mean that if you if you put the masses into the theory and you do calculations, you get up you, the, the, you get results that are infinite. So it makes no sense. But we know that if we look at the electron as a mass, we know that there is mass there. So we have to figure out a way, we have to invent a trick so that we can start out with some theory that has no masses, and then uh, something happens, and then stuff comes out with masses. <laughs> we have to somehow figure out a trick. 
And there are several ways of doing this. And Mr. Higgs, actually not just Mr. Higgs, there were a few other people that I'm not so happy because it's Peter. I, I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Higgs mechanism was invented in the 1960s to, to do this, to do this trick, and has been the most popular for, for many, many years, although there were many other tricks to do the same things. And we did not know if this mechanism was the correct one until 2012. And, and now it looks like it is correct. Or, and, but it has been known since the late 70s that this mechanism has some problems. And so we'll get to that later, okay, why that is. Mm -hmm. So what, what is this trick with the Higgs? So the assumption is that all of space is permeated by a Higgs field. Just kind of like a, a magnetic field that permeates space, although you cannot take that uh, anal anal analogy too, too far. And then as the particles travel through the, as something travels through this, this Higgs field, the particles interact with the Higgs field, and by, by the, the amount of interaction, they, they gain inertia. Okay? So this seems pretty weird. And so, how, what am I talking about? So let's talk about Margaret Thatcher. Okay. So, uh, why am I talking about Margaret Thatcher? When uh, <coughs> the Europeans decided to build this big accelerator in Geneva, which by the way they decided to do because the Americans wanted to build one in Texas, that, which would have been a lot better and a lot bigger, but then this was canceled in 1992, and then the Europeans took it over. They had to convince their governments to build, to, to give money, okay? And it was a challenge. Uh, the science minister of the, of the United Kingdom challenged physicists to produce a one-page answer to the question, why is the Higgs boson and why do we want to find it? And so there was a little bit of a competition to explain it in, in one page. And this is the, this is the, the, winning, uh, the winning answer. But this is not the one page, this is the cartoon of the one page. Imagine that you have a room with a cocktail party full of uh, member of parliament and lobbyists. I, I don't know if they have lobbyists in the UK, I suppose they do. And they're, they're, it's, a, it's a cocktail party, so they're chatting and talking and, and having, having their drinks. And then Margaret Thatcher comes in. <laughs> so what happens if Margaret Thatcher comes in? Everybody is going to go and try to talk to her. So she has a big interaction with the, with the people there. And now if you think about it, She's going to have difficulty moving through the crowd. Her inertia is getting larger. Okay? And if you set Margaret Thatcher in motion with her entourage, it's going to be very hard to stop, to, to stop her. So this is the analogy of the cocktail part in Margaret Thatcher and with the Higgs boson and particles. So as particles go through, the, through to this, to this, to this field, they interact with the, f the field, and by the amount of interaction, they, they gain inertia, and so they gain mass. Okay? Wow. Now, a word of caution. It has been said the Higgs boson is great because it gives mass to everything in the universe. It's not really true, it's kind of a lie. It's a white lie. The Higgs mass, the Higgs gives mass to, for example, electrons and quarks. But most of the masses, the mass in this table is in the nuclei of the, of the material, so it's in protons and neutrons. And only 10% of the masses of a proton is coming from quarks. The other 90% is associated with the energy and the interaction of the quarks inside the proton. So it's a little, you know, it sounds a lot more exciting to say that the Higgs gives mass to everything, but it's not really, really true. It gives mass to the quarks and the, electro and the electron, but the protons themselves get mass from uh, most of their masses from something else. Okay. So, so we call uh, we call this the standard model of particle interaction, which was developed in the starting in the 1960s uh, and got refined as we went along. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful theory. You can fit it on a t-shirt. 
where it is. Uh, the, this phi, this Greek letter phi is the Higgs, so the Higgs gets two out of four lines in the standard model with the t-shirt. And you can also put it on a, on, a, on a coffee cup. But that's also, again, a lie, because in reality, the equation is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even this equation uh, uh, is, uh, is also a little bit of a lie, because there's a lot of shorthand in this equation. So uh, anyway, if you can solve it, then you solve the, uh, everything. Wait, what is the equation for? Uh, technically, it's the Lagrangian of the standard model. OK, now the standard model is also an incredibly amazing theory. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. Uh, it turns out that it predicts that the ele electrons behave like little magnets. It predicts it. It doesn't, you don't have to put it in in the model. It just comes out. And yes, electrons. Wait, wait. Electrons yeah. always must be paired to act like yeah. a mag. To what? They always have to be paired to act like well, it has a magnetic moment. This is the magnetic moment. Yes, that's but that's just. I took chemistry for postdoc once. Ask the people in, in your chemistry part. If you have one electron, you cannot create a spin. But if you have two, you can have one. No, I, the electron by itself has a spin. Want to make that? Yeah. 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 What is that? 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 So not only not only predicts the strength the strength of this magnet, uh, not only predicts that it has a magnet, it has a little, like a little magnet, but it, it predicts the strength, which is given by this equation, and then it has this fat this this thing here called G, which is about two with a little correction. And the correction, we can calculate the correction in theory, which is this, it's about one per mil. <laughs> And we can measure it in experiments, and they agree to an incredible number of digits. <laughs> okay, I think it's probably the most predictive and accurate theory that exists in, in science today. Okay, so <clears throat> the Higgs boson was found uh, was discovered at this accelerator called this large called the Large Hadron Collider uh, at the Center for European Nuclear Research in Geneva. Uh, LHC, Large Hadron Collider. So it's an accelerator that accelerates two beams of protons to a kinetic energy of 6,500 giga electron volts per beam. So remember, the proton mass is one giga electron volt. And then these beams are brought into collision head on. And when the two protons hit each other, the kinetic energy can be used to make other particles using famous E equal mc squared equation. And occasionally, you might make a, a Higgs boson coming out of this uh, collision, and, and we go look for it. And then detectors are placed around the collision points to, to, to gather the data and take uh, effectively electronic pictures of everything that comes up. And I'll show you, I'll sh I will show you a picture in a minute. So an accelerator is humongous. So this is a picture. This is a, a, what, what we have here. So this is Mont Blanc. Um, that's, this is downtown Geneva over here. Wow. This is Lake Geneva. For scale, this is the land. This is the airport, Geneva Airport. The accelerator goes around like this. It's a 17-mile-long tunnel, 300 feet below ground. Uh, CERN, the, the laboratory, has a campus which is somewhere over here right on the border between Switzerland and France. In fact, most of the accelerators are actually in France, not in Switzerland. And, uh, and then there are experiments at uh, various points in the, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the accelerator ring. Uh, this is a picture of the ring inside. It's a, it's a collection. It's full of magnets. These are uh, superconducting magnets running at liquid helium temperature. It's the biggest cryogenic system in the world. Jeez. So there's 17 miles of this, full of this, uh, this uh, magnets. And the magnets are used to keep the proton going around in a circle. Mm. Uh, so there are 96 wow. tons of liquid helium. There's a vacuum pipe, which is 17 miles long. The protons go around the ring 11,000 times a second. Bunches of protons collide every 50 nanoseconds. 
each bunch, so remember now you have these bunches going around seven, uh, whatever it was, 17 miles, and then you have to hit them right on top, right against each other. They have to just, you have to aim it at, the, at each other. And the size of these bunches are 50 microns in, in, that, in, uh, in, um, in, the, in diameter. They are like a, a third of a quarter of the size of a human hair in, in size. So you have to control it very precisely. Uh, there, are, there are 100 billion protons in each bunch. <laughs> And most of the protons, even if they are so well collimated, they just fly through each other, the bunches fly through each other, and then maybe 20, 20 of them per bunch hit another proton and something happens. They're doing mm -hmm. six tenths the speed of light, aren't they? What? They're doing six tenths. No, 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 it's 99.9. 99.9999999. Yeah, yeah. That's because there are, some, there are very many bunches. The whole accelerator is full of bunches. Mm -hmm. I will show you actually a little animation for that. Well, here's the animation. That all starts with a hydrogen bulb. That's where you get the protons. Okay? And uh, so they, they go, come out of the hydrogen bulb, they get ionized, and then they go into a linear accelerator. They go into a little accelerator called the booster. Another accelerator called the PS, which was the state of the art in the 60s. Another accelerator called the SPS, which was the state of the art in the 80s. And then it gets thrown into the big. Uh, the big collider. Now you see there are many, many bunches going around. Okay. Uh, and then there are <coughs> there are uh, four experiments around the ring. Uh, the two bigger ones are CMS called CMS and Atlas. Um, Santa Barbara. You, you see Santa Barbara works on CMS. So these these are the good guys. Cool. And those were the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Is it my problem? No, it's uh, okay, fine. It's uh, and then there are a couple of specialized smaller experiments called LHCB and Alice. Um, so CMS is the detector that we worked on uh, here at Santa Barbara. We built some pieces of, of the detector and we shipped them to, to, to CERN and we, and we installed them at CERN. So here, uh, the detector is the camera that records the interaction. As I said, UCSB works with CMS. Each detector was designed and is operated by a collaboration of thousands of physicists, thousands of scientists. They took about 12 years to build. And, after, and now we are actually in a phase of upgrades where actually we are building more, uh, more and better pieces to make it work better and better. So this is a picture of the of the excel, of the detector, it's like an on, it's like a, an onion, and you peel the onions, and there are various layers of detector. It's complicated and everything, but what I want to point out is that this is a person for scale. Oh. So this is our camera. Okay. Uh, I think these numbers are obsolete because I, I stole a, a slide from a talk that I gave some years ago. But there are about two thousand phys PhD physicists. 1,000 PhD students and 1,000 engineers. And uh, for CMS, CMS is an Italian, American, Russian experiment, mostly. But we have a lot of other countries as well. So it's good to know Italian and English. Everybody speaks English. <laughs> I speak Italian also, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, well, I, there are some advantages. Um, these are the institutions in the United States that are involved in this. They are kind of all over the place. In California, we have San UC San Diego, Caltech, UC Riverside, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Livermore, and UC Davis. The other UCs are with the, with the bad guys, the other experiment. <laughs> UC Irvine, and uh, UC Santa Cruz, and UC Berkeley are with the other guys. So you know, so you, you can see that it's a, it's a large collaboration of universities all over the United States, and in fact, all over the world, as I, as I was showing you over here. These are pictures of the detectors it was being assembled. This is our camera. What you're seeing here is a humongous a superconducting coil as, a, as it's being uh, uh, installed in the detector. It has a 3.8 Tesla magnetic field. It has 2.3 gigajoule joule stored energy which is in the magnetic field, which is like one half of a ton of TNT, okay, of energy stored in this magnetic field. 
This is another picture as, a, as things were being assembled. These are people for scale. You must admit the colors are pretty nice, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this is uh, the two half, half of the detectors before they got, they get closed. Here's some guy. I don't know what he's doing there. <laughs> but he has a nice helmet. It's the same helmet in my picture, by the way. And uh, this is what happens. This is a picture of the detector and what happens when, uh, when particles uh, in, uh, interact. So particles are coming in from both ends of this detector, which is a, like, like a big cylinder. And they come in. They hit each other. And then the whole hell breaks loose. <laughs> Boom. This, this is a typical interaction. You see all the particles coming through. They bend because they have charged particles and they bend into mag magnetic fields. So we measure the bend of the particles to measure their energy. And then they deposit energy in the, in the, in the outer part of the detector. And these blue, these, these blue things here are like, uh, are like uh, the... These blue things are like the energy depositions. Yes. Uh, uh, cloud chambers? Are they no, no. The cloud chambers are way, way, way too slow. Uh, the, for the tracking, what we have is like 200 square meter of silicon detector. So kind of like the stuff you have in a camera, but 200 square meters worth of it. And it's a little bit more sophisticated also because it has to take a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot more data and also a lot of radiation. It has to survive radiation. Um, How fast do they think right out? So, yeah, so that's an interesting question because it turns out that uh, we cannot read out all of the data coming out because there's too much data coming out. So we read out about uh, one or two kilohertz of data of uh, interactions in each, uh, so 1,000 or 2,000 a second, and every, each interaction is uh, maybe 100 megabyte. So we, we have one of the biggest, we, well, now people talk about big data. Well, this is big data. <laughs> yes. You keep saying a oh, camera, a big hole. Well, it's like a camera. Okay. How do they get those pictures? These pictures, it, it's because it's uh, every little detector records. Uh, records uh, so, for example, you have a particle going through, and you have more than many, many detectors, and you record the point where the particle goes through at every, in every detector. And then we, work, we write software to join together all of the points, and then we make pictures like this. The pic these pictures are just for, for show. So you sample the data then? We sample the data. You randomly sample? No, absolutely not. How do you know you're not missing something? Absolutely. Very good question. Uh, we, we, we don't sleep at night thinking that we might. So there is, a, there, is a, there is a what we call a trigger. So you call it the trigger is what selects the events. And there's a trigger menu which is made up of 300 different paths with different, with different uh, uh, conditions. And uh, we try to cover, cover where we think the interesting stuff is, but it's like uh, you know, looking for your keys under a lamppost. <laughs> and so... Uh, I always hated that. Huh? I always hated that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and uh, yes, so that's, that's a concern. And uh, we always worry, you know, are we missing something because the interesting stuff is something that we haven't thought about. So you set a threshold, basically. We set, we set thresholds. We set uh, combinations of things. Okay. All, all sorts of... It's, a, it's really a menu. Yeah. Okay. okay, so how do we find the Higgs? So uh, if the Higgs exists, the standard model will tell us how it behaves. And we can prob calculate the probability that a Higgs is made in a, made in a random collision. Now the problem is that the probability is tiny, 10 to the minus 1 in a billion. So 1 in a billion of the collisions a Higgs might be made. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go look at it. And it's a needle in a haystack type of problem. Uh, and then it gets worse because as soon as it, is, as it is made, the Higgs decays. For example, the Higgs can decay into two photons, two gamma rays. And so we have to search for events that are consistent with having the decay products. And then there are many possible ways that the Higgs can decay. And the pattern of decay changes drastically depending on what the mass of the Higgs boson is. Now we know what the mass is, but when we started, we didn't know what the mass was. And then some decays can never be seen because there are other processes that just 
swamping with backwards. So this is a this is a scary picture. It's complicated, but this is the, this this is before before we knew what the mass was. Now we know that the mass is 125, so that this is the mass. This is the mass. This is the probability for a given decay. For, for example, so this decay, which is which is into a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark, is the dominant one, like 80% of the time. Well, this one is almost impossible to see. We just barely saw it uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, few months, mm -hmm. and so, and so there are all, all kinds of decays, and uh, the three decays that were used to discover the Higgs boson were this one, this green curve here, so which happened only 10% of the time, this purple curve, one in one in a hundred, and then these two photon, these two gamma ray curve, which happened. Uh, fraction of a percent of the time. Uh, actually, my group, we worked, we concentrated on this guy, and boy, if the Higgs boson had been 200 GV, it would have been like shooting fish in a barrel. It would have been really easy. <laughs> Turned out that it was down here, and, uh, and so this was like, uh, it was like blood, tears, and, <laughs> and sweat to get, to get this thing out. Because, because there, are, there are so many possibilities that the collaboration was, was divided into several groups, and each group was going for, going after a certain signature. Okay, so how do we discover a new particle? The best way is what we call it a mass bump. Suppose I have a particle A, big A, that decays into three particles. And I, I measure these three particles. So I measure the energies and I measure the directions. And then basically using E equal mc squared, I construct a special function, which is called the invariant mass function. And, so it, and then I make a histogram of this invariant mass. So imagine now that I have these three particles, A, B, and C. And they do not come from this. They come from somewhere else. Then, uh, this, then uh, this would be featureless. It would look, look something like this. Okay? But if they come from the same particles, they will all be at the same, reconstruct the same mass, but, but my detector is not perfect, so there will be some resolution in here. And, and then when I take the events that are not from A, and the events that are from A, and, I, and of course, an event comes out and doesn't say, hey, physicist, I'm, I'm a Higgs decay. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, we have to put them together, and then we can say, then you would see a bump. So that's, that's a mass bump. That's the, that's the easy, quote unquote, easiest way to discover a particle, through a mass bump. And in fact, this is what happened. This is the Higgs to two uh, gamma rays in 2012. And you see that there are a whole bunch of gamma rays, a continuous distribution. And then here there's a little bit of a bump at uh, 125. And this is Higgs to four electrons of four muons of two muons and two electrons. And this is the distribution. There is a bump here, obviously, but this bump is a particle that we know of, that we know very well, <coughs> Z boson. And the, the, by the way, the, the, blue, the, the light blue histogram is what we predict the distribution to look like if the Higgs did not exist. Yeah. So we know we predict it. And then here there's a little bit of an accumulation of events. There's a little bit of a, a, a bump. Now this, this, this nice red curve is very nice because it draws your eyes. So it makes, it makes the bump really stick out. Okay? Uh, what, you know, what about this? Is that a bump? Uh, and then uh, this is the, the one that I worked on, which, was, uh, which did not have a bump because it has two neutrinos and we cannot reconstruct, we cannot see the neutrinos. And what we could see was a few more events here on top of what we would have expected from other, from other, from other sources. So this was, this was uh, the difficult one for us. Can I ask you, your, your chart showed uh, 125 is way off to the right there, but you... No, but because this is not, this is something else. This is, we cannot reconstruct the mass, so this is some other, okay. some other distribution. Okay. This happens to be the mass of the two muons, or the mass of the muon and the electron. Okay. Yeah. And since 2012, uh, we have gotten much more data. So this is the little bump that we had before. Now this is what it looks like 
Uh, we actually have four times more data than this that we are, we are still analyzing. Uh, so you know, now, now it's there. Uh, so what have we done since then? We have studied the Higgs properties to death as much as we could. We wrote dozens, dozens of papers to try to understand what does Higgs look like? Does it look like the, the Higgs that we think, does it look like it should look like? Uh, and, and, and now I'm gonna say, unfortunately, <laughs> everything checks out as expected at about the 10% level, okay? So is this a success or is this a crisis? So I told you that the standard model is great. We can calculate the, the, the magnetic uh, properties of an electron very, very uh, precisely. But there are things that we don't understand, we like to under understand. Why, why is this replication of the quarks three times? Why three families? Why not four? Why not two? Why not, you know, why not one, just one? Why are the masses so different? Why are these building blocks? Why, do, why is it that these building blocks have masses that are so different? Why are there four interactions, only four interactions, and why do they look like they, they, they look? Electromagnetism, the weak interaction, the strong interaction, and gravity, and other more technical things. And then there are things that are just plain missing. Uh, the dark matter. The dark, the dark matter does not exist in this model. We don't know what it is. Uh, so something is wrong, Some, the, dark, the, the, the model is incomplete. Uh, where is the antimatter? When the Big Bang happened, big explosion, matter and antimatter was, was created, matter and antimatter annihilated, but somehow a little bit of matter survived and the antimatter went away. Why is that? What's happening there? And then what about gravity? It turns out uh, that gravity and quantum mechanics don't work together. So there are things that are, that are missing that tell us that the standard model, as beautiful as it is, is not the final answer. And now the Higgs is particularly causes some confusion. Now this, this is gonna be the only equations that I write. Um, so there's this equation here, that the mass of the Higgs Square. squared is equal to some mass that we put into the equation, squared, minus some correction that comes from quantum mechanics. And this correction is roughly given by some integral of some function that we know how to calculate from zero to infinity over the energy. Okay. And it's, like, it's sort of like this. This number g should be two, but there are some corrections. Okay, the correction here is one part in a thousand. And here there's a correction also here. That has more or less this form. Okay, so this is the correction. And this is a function, uh, artist conception of what the function looks like. Uh, so this is the function, this is the energy, and it, go, it, go, it does this. But we have to take the integral from zero to infinity to get the correction. I remind you from uh, high school calculus that the integral is just the area under the curve, okay? So I need to calculate the area under this curve, but the problem is that that's what the curve looks like. Okay? So that's a problem. Uh, and but, so how do I fi fix the problem? Well, this is, this, the physics that I know is over here, and then I, maybe, maybe there is some physics out here that I don't understand, a very, 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 very high energy. And then, and this physics would take this curve and make it go down like this, and then this, this integral would be finite, this, this area would be finite, and then everything would be post-potentially okay. All right, but now, what is the area of this curve? Well, I can approximate it as a triangle like this, okay? So the area of a triangle, uh, junior high geometry, is the, the base times the height divided by two. So the height is A times E nu, the base is E nu, so this is the area, okay? So this is the correction. So the correction is, is this, so I have that the square of the mass, the mass that I see, is some mass that I put in minus this correction here. 
But now what can in you be? So I don't know, some, something that is happening at very, 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 very high energy, and I know that something must happen when, when gravity gets quantized. When gravity gets quantized, something must happen, and it's not in my model, my model is wrong. So I can say, okay, well, this new energy is the energy where gravity gets quantized. Well, it turns out to be this huge number. And so when I put this huge number in here, I get that the square of the Higgs mass that I measure is some parameter that I put in by hand, minus 10 to the 9, 19 GeV squared, and I gotta get 125 GeV squared out of it. Hmm. So I have to have a huge number here, minus another huge number here, that just are so to give me this tiny number. Okay? We call this the problem of naturalness, that this is not natural to have something like this. Let me, let me give you an, an analogy to explain how crazy this is. Suppose you have an accountant sitting in Washington that tallies all of the government expenses in 2019. Now I looked them up, it's about $3.8 trillion. Okay? So more exactly, let's imagine that this is what comes out of the US Treasury every year. And then I have another accountant that tallies out the tax revenues. And let's pretend that there are also 3.8 trillions. It's not, <laughs> and we know it doesn't work quite that way, but pretend, let's, pre let's pretend that it does. And, and this is what I get, 3, 8, 6, 7, 9, 8, 7, 9, 6, 7, 3, 2, 1, 6, 6. So the balance is one cent. Okay, so if the two accountants came to you and said, we, we balance the book with this 3.8 million to one cent, you have two choices. You can say this is an accident, you just got lucky, or, there is some mechanism that I don't understand that ties the money that comes out with the money that comes in. And so this is what we think is happening here, that there must be some mechanism that ties these numbers here, or that the numbers, or that the numbers are not so, so different, and that in, fact, <coughs> that in fact, this new physics doesn't happen at 10 to the 19 GB, but happens over here at about 100 or 1,000 GeV. Okay? So, before the LHC turned on, we were con convinced that we were going to discover the Higgs or something like it. Uh, but we, we also were convinced that if it was the Higgs, there should have probably been also some other interesting stuff happening at, that, at those energies to prevent so that the cancellation wouldn't be so ridiculous. Okay? And there were many proposals that were made by theorists. And theorists were really, really, really convinced that this was happening, to the, to the point that uh, many theorists were worried that, uh, we would, that we would see new physics, but the new physics would be so complicated that we wouldn't know how to figure out what it would be. And this was, for that, for, this was also almost looked like a, a crisis, and people ran, uh, ran workshops called the LHC Olympics, where they made fake data, and they gave them to teams, fake new physics data, they, make them, they gave them to, new, to various teams of people to go, okay, try to figure out what it is, okay? That was, people thought that that was a problem. Uh, one of my colleagues from Berkeley had the best retort to this, he said, look, we find new physics, we all go to Stockholm and then we we'll worry about it when we come back. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. And, and then the interesting thing is that some of this proposal, for example, a new theory called supersymmetry, would have also solved other problems. So, for example, supersymmetry would have solved this problem. There would have been no big cancellations to worry about. And it would have given us as a bonus dark matter. Hmm. It would have been great. And so this was the favorite uh, the favorite uh, uh, theory of new physics before we started running the LSC, and I spent the last uh, seven years uh, working on supersymmetry, uh, but it has not worked out. It's not there. We haven't found it. So this is the puzzle. The LSC continues to accumulate more data. The most obvious ideas of what new physics must be could be have been ruled out. And we continue to look in more exotic corners, and as you said, we worry that we've, we throw away the baby with the bathwater. 
okay? We, we're looking. We, we try to leave no stone unturned. And the problem is that when we are sure that there's new physics somewhere, we now have lost guidance of where the physics could be. It could be anywhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 19 GeV. And it would be good to, it would be great if we could bring an accelerator to go to 10 to the 19 GeV, but this would be an accelerator the size of the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little, a little too expensive. <laughs> but the galaxy itself isn't, not the galaxy, but the, the cosmos itself is an accelerator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And so this is, this is one of the connections now between the very big and the very small that I was talking about earlier. Okay, so to conclude, the discovery of this particle has been a tremendous success for particle physics, for the standard model, and I find myself to be extremely lucky and privileged to have been part of this journey. The theories developed the theory in the 60s and the 70s, more theories to figure out how to make detailed calculations that help us in designing the experiment and interpreting the experiments. Us experimentalists came together, all ten thousands of us, with all that, uh, all the complications that, might, that you can imagine, to build these detectors and to do the data analysis. Machine physicists designed and operated the LOC. It was like, you know, a tremendous worldwide uh, collaboration of people, and of course the taxpayers uh, footed the bill. Uh, but the new physics that we expected, we were hoping to show up, at, would show up at the LSC, did not show up, at least for now. The LSC is going to run for another 15 years or so. Uh, it's going to get upgraded in terms of uh, intensity and so on. And, and we are looking all in all corners of face space. But the reality is that we are confused. Thank you. Because uh, uh, the LHC is a, is a dirty environment. There's a lot of other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the Europeans are putting forth a plan for the future. And part of that plan is to build a dedicated electron positron collider mm -hmm. where everything would be a lot cleaner and things right. could be measured. Mm -hmm. For example, Basic things like uh, what what it can decay into. <coughs> this decay has barely been seen. The black the black curve, the purple curve is absolutely impossible to see. It's too difficult. 
This red curve has sort of been seen. This green curve is impossible to see. Uh, this one has not been seen yet. And uh, but but uh, but with the with an acceler with a different type of accelerator, you can really study this to 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 one percent. That's the answer. I still don't understand from the Maggie Thatcher joke how the properties of mechanics, the mass, the inertia, and, and of course the distortion of the space time that gravity requires comes from this particle at this particular energy. So gravity, gravity is a separate story, but mass is inertia. Right? So imagine imagine that uh, that you are Huh? F equal ma. Yeah. In inertia. Right. It's inertia. So imagine now that you have a you have a a ball, and you're in, and you're throwing the ball. It's not a very good it's not a perfect analogy, but and you're throwing a ball through molasses because of the because the ball interacts with the molasses. The ball slows down. It's like it has a lot of inertia. What's slowing down is not yeah, I, I, I said, I said, I said yeah. that it wasn't the a very... Things that move steadily are not affected, only accelerating. Absolutely right. I said that it wasn't a very good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's this kind of thing. It's, it's, uh, it's by, by the interaction with this field, with this, uh, with this field, it acquires inertia. And the field itself is just presence of the scattering of things? No, the field itself is something that we, we think is all over the universe. Just like, it would be like a huge magnetic field that is everywhere. There are these particles. And, and, and how does the particle and the field, those are two different words, what do they mean physically? What's the connection? That's so the particle, technically the par particle is an excitation of the field. So, so a it's particle... It's a state of the field. It's it sort of a state of the field. <laughs> It's like so. A particle is a, for each field for a field. There is a particle associated with it. So, for the magnetic field and the electric field, there is a particle associated with it, which is the electron. Photon. The, sorry, the photon. Like the, like the quantum step, you could say, in the state pattern of the field. E uh, sort the, of. Yes. The field can exist in this configuration or the next configuration. The difference being of uh, one particle. Uh, not, 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 not quite. Is it okay to say that the particle is in the field? Yeah, yeah. It's an excitation of the field. Yes. How does the field affect the flavor of the universe? Yeah, that's a good question uh, because actually. Because as we know, they change flavor as they travel through space. Right. That's a separate issue because the, the field only affects the masses. It doesn't affect the flavor. But actually, why, why we, we, we know that the Higgs gives masses to these guys? We do not really know if the Higgs gives masses to this guy, these guys. Uh, in fact, uh, they could be, in fact, we think it's something else. Uh, in fact, we think, we think that there's a good chance that the neutrinos are very special particles that are their own antiparticles. They also have the reverse magnetic moments of what we would expect to with the general. Well, nobody says Neutrinos do not have magnetic moments. No, you measure neutrinos by their interactions with uh, and the interactions is, is to the exchange of W particles and Z particles. Yeah. I got a much more mundane question. Yes. An engineer. Uh, number one, uh, you've got the 17 mile ring that's at a high vacuum. Yes. You must have some valves, something you can shut off when you go in and put these detectors in. And number two, um, you said that the field in there was like 3.7 Tesla, which is the minimum twice what's necessary to saturate any ferromagnetic material. Right. I mean, still like 20, right. 22 right. Teslas. What, well, how, those are toroidal magnets. So the magnetic no, 
uh, there are, there, so we, there are two sets of magnets. Uh -huh. there are the magnets in the these magnets here. Solar magnets. Right. Yeah, these magnets here. Right. These are dipole and quadrupoles. Oh, okay. The dipole make the make the make the beam turn and the quadrupoles focus. So these aren't that at two at three three point seven. No, no, these are more actually. Oh really? Yeah. Oops. I'm sorry. It's temperamental ca cable connection there. No, it may have been me. I pressed the wrong button or something. Mm -hmm. Turned it off. There you go. Um, let's see. Uh, are, I, think, I think these magnets are 8 Tesla, the dipoles. Uh, this, but they're small. And the, the, the vacuum pipe is inside the magnet, so, okay, so, so you know, people can walk around. Um, the, Do they have to bring their keys? <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, they have to have, a, they have to have a respiration, uh, uh, um, you know, if, if they quench and all, and all the helium, uh, and all the helium evaporates, they're going to die for lack of oxygen, so they have to have also that's that. That's very good. That's very good. So, uh, this mic, so when, when there, so they, they, there's, a, there's a pipe here that goes through when, the, when, the, when we run the experiment. When we, when we access the detector, which happens only once a year like this, uh, then uh, the pipe that goes through the so the detector is removed and so that we can access it. Okay, so there's valves that shut off. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we had, we had uh, several months ago, a, a discussion of dark matter. Yes. Could dark matter be your, your, your uh, correction? Um, no, the, yes, in the sense that, for example, the supersymmetry that I was talking that what I was talking about, and I spent the last uh, ten years of my life chasing, uh, with no success whatsoever, um, would, would also have dark matter coming in. It would the dark matter would actually not not affect that correction very much. It would be other things that come with supersymmetry that would affect that correction. But super, people love supersymmetry because it would also give you that matter just for, for free. Thanks for chasing it. The other, all of the forces, the other forces, bosons are the, the force carrier. Correct. So, in using that thinking, if the Higgs is a boson, what is the, the force that it's carrying? Uh, it's not, that? yeah, it, it, they're, they're, it's a different, okay, this is, this is where the dog, see that the equation looks different, <laughs> but, but it's a different type, of, it's a different type of interaction, it doesn't look like the interaction of, uh, of photons or of gluons or of W's and Z quarks, it's a different type of interaction, and this is why the Higgs is special, the Higgs, has, the, the, the reason why you have this big correction is the Higgs has spin zero. It's the only particle that has spin zero. It's a fundamental particle that has no spin. And the, the problem with the, with the quantum correction comes from the fact that it's a particle with no spin. So it's an interaction, but it's a, it's, it's a different type of interaction. We don't really talk about it as a force. We talk about it as, a, well, as an interaction. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also force in some sense. Could you say it, it's kind of like the force carrier of momentum? <coughs> no. No. It wouldn't be that. Okay. It would not be that, no. Hmm. I have a fairly primitive understanding of this, but at one time you, you talked about the four forces and you mentioned gravity. Yeah. I'm having trouble understanding gravity as a force. I thought gravity was just. <coughs> Yeah, in, okay. In, uh, in classical physics, gravity is just a force. In, uh, in, in general relativity, it's the bending of space. But, but the, the, the marrying the general, general relativity and the bending of space in quantum mechanics has proved a very difficult problem, and we don't have a theory that does that. So we, we still call it an interaction, although it's supposed to. 
it, it, it has to do with the bed in your space. All of the standard model is done in, in flat space. Okay, so at some point we need to put it into bent, into curved space, and we have to do that when uh, when the energies are very very large, and that's when we, that's why we know that this is not the final story. Hmm. That suggests a question in all the quantum theory we have. There's a relation between the frequency of whatever it is and the energy. Yes. True. The Planck constant. Correct. Would that hold for gravity as, as believed, or would there be a new Planck constant? Since you're saying the two don't go together. So it's a major discovery of the whole idea of quantum mechanics yeah. is defined. Correct. Um, I'm trying to come up with, a, with, a, with an answer that's not totally stupid. You're a big reporter. The, the bottom line is that nobody knows how to do that. Uh, really, I mean, so no one knows. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, maybe the string theorists think they know how to do that, <laughs> but nobody really knows how to do that. In a, in a way that in a way that fits all the way from uh, from uh, from the energies at which this is relevant, all the way to the energies that we have probed in the laboratory. It's my stupid, simplistic, infantile notion that I came up with when I first heard about the Higgs boson. Oh, they found an even smaller particle. But they're all small. They, are, they have no size. They're even smaller. But I what, what, what I grew up with at atoms, and I don't know if we learned that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Then suddenly they became made up of quarks. Right. And my thinking was, oh, old man Higgs said, now everything's made up of both no, that's not true. The explosions sit over here separately. Now the question is whether the quarks are actually is up. Maybe there's something inside here. Okay, that's a, that's a question. <laughs> and, uh, and and you see, you see when it says less than ten to the minus sixteen centimeter in size. Uh, so this is one thousand the size of the proton. This is as as far as we were able to probe experimentally. Okay. Now it could be it could be that there are, there are things in here, and, and there are theories that say that there are things in there. They're called prions. I mean, we we, we like to invent names, um, <laughs> but they don't work very well these theories. And so I think now I think now most people think that no, there's nothing inside. These are just these are just a point things with no size. But but we are confused. So I don't know, right? We we don't know. Certainly none of the rest of the from, 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 the point, from the point of view of the measurements, leaving aside what the theorists tell us, since they've since still being recorded, right? Because everything they told us was, has, has been proven to be not so correct over the last 30 years. Maybe maybe it is that there is some stuff in here. And yeah, this is one of the things that one, this is one of the things that we're looking for all the time. So Higgs doesn't make up everything. No, Higgs is something that's another part. It's another part. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we have to thank you.